I learned something this week. Strictly out of convenience, for no other reason, I have been, uh, for the last several months, doing my morning Bible reading on my phone. I've got all of my devotions on here, and I would just pull up. After I get through reading my devotions, just pull up the Bible, and I just start reading. But guys, I knew it just wasn't it just wasn't filling me. It just wasn't what I get when I actually read a copy of God's Word. So this week, I put my laziness down. And I picked back up my life application study Bible. And I began to search the Scriptures and pray over the message that the Lord would have me to bring today. And He led me to a passage of Scripture about a man that never speaks a word in the entire Bible. Yet, he is one of the most important characters, not only in the Christmas story, but in the entire sacred accounts. He's a man that we know where he was born and we know to whom he was born, but we have no record of when he died or where he died. He is a man that was faithful to follow the Lord no matter what was asked of him, no matter what it cost him. Church, I'm talking about Joseph, the Virgin Mary's husband and the earthly father of Jesus. So turn with me in your copy of God's Word to the Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. The Gospel of Matthew chapter 1. And we're going to begin our reading this morning with verse 18. Matthew chapter 1, verse 18. Now church, you need to remember contextually that Matthew is the first book of the New Testament and it is the bridge that connects the Old Testament to the New Testament. Matthew was primarily written to a Jewish audience in order to prove to the Jews that Jesus is the long-anticipated, long-awaited Messiah. And you're going to see a whole lot of phrases in Matthew that says, um, as it is written, because it is written. Uh, for such a fulfilled prophecy of. Uh, you'll see those phrases because that is the place where an Old Testament prophecy was fulfilled by Jesus. I've got almost every one of them in Matthew underlined in my Bible. And if you've got one of those Bibles that's got the references in it, it'll take you back to that Old Testament prophecy that Jesus fulfilled. Now, the first 15 verses of Matthew are one of those accounts that a lot of y'all think is boring. And I understand because this is the first 15 verses. So-and-so begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. They begat so-and-so who begat so-and-so. And on and on and on and on and on. you got this one begat that one begat that one begat that one. Until you get to verse 16. Look at verse 16. And Jacob begat Joseph the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called the Christ. Now guys, as we know, Jesus, excuse me, Joseph was Jesus' earthly father, but he was not of any blood relation to him. So instead of saying that Joseph begat Jesus, which would have been incorrect, the Bible, which is always accurate, always true 100% of the time, says that Joseph was the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus. That brings us to our passage today, Matthew chapter 1, beginning with verse 18. If you're ready to grow in your Bible, would you say amen? Amen. 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 If you didn't bring your Bible today, you want to follow along on the screen, we've got it up there for you. Now, the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and she shall call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. 
Then Joseph, being raised from sleep, did as the angel of the Lord had bidden him, and took unto him his wife, and knew her not till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and called his name Jesus. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, may the words of my mouth and meditations of my heart be acceptable in your sight today. O oh Lord, my strength and my redeemer. I am weak. Praise God, you are strong. My voice is very weak today, God, and I just need you to show up and show out and speak through me today. Lord, we love you and we completely turn this service over to you in Jesus' name. Amen. During my prayer and Bible study time this week, the Lord gave me seven takeaways from the life of Joseph that He wants me to share with you. And all seven of these are extremely relevant and they're extremely applicable and they're extremely important to our lives today. Takeaway number one. Joseph loved his spouse. Joseph loved his spouse. Now we know from Scripture that Joseph was betrothed to Mary. Now that word betrothed it's very similar to our word engaged, but it's slightly different. If two people were betrothed to each other, they had legally committed themselves to each other, and that legal commitment could only be broken through death and divorce. However, the marriage had not yet been consummated, and they had not had any sexual relations. We also learn in Luke chapter 1, that Mary's cousin, Elizabeth, had become pregnant with John the Baptist. And Mary, when she hears of this, goes to stay with Elizabeth and help her out a while. And you can imagine Joseph's shock when Mary comes back. She left his little bitty tiny servant uh, virgin uh, fiance and she comes back great with child. And you can imagine the shock on Joseph's face. Mary tries to explain to Joseph that she hadn't cheated on him. In fact, the exact opposite is true. She had been faithful, very faithful. So faithful, in fact, that the Lord chose her of all the virgins in the entire world. The Lord chose Mary to give birth to His Son, the Messiah. But Joseph couldn't wrap his head around this. He couldn't understand what was happening. Now, I don't know about you, but I understand Joseph's point of view, I wouldn't be able to figure it out and understand it either. Any of us would have felt the exact same way. Now, in this situation, the Old Testament legal system provided a way out for Joseph. The Old Testament legal system said, Joseph, you can have Mary stoned and killed for what she's just done. Look on the screen in Deuteronomy chapter 22. If a damsel that's a virgin be betrothed to a husband, and a man find her in the city and lie with her, then ye shall bring them both out to the gate of that city, and ye shall stone them with stones that they die. The damsel, because she cried not, being in the city. The man, because he humbled his neighbor's wife. So thou shalt put away evil from among you. Huh. What if we were still living in that type of society today? where people got stoned to death if they'd had sex before they got married. Woo, it sure did get quiet in here then. Hmm. Be a lot of dead people, wouldn't it? You know, I'm not, I'm not so sure that's not a half bad idea. You know, it would cut down on a lot of the diseases that we have today. If you didn't just crawl in the back seat with anything you could get to sit still long enough. But that's not what we live under today. Guys, even though Joseph was at the end of the law to have Mary stoned to death, Joseph loved Mary deeply. And the Bible says he didn't want to kill her. Our passage today says he was minded to put her away privately and not make a public example out of her. Now, why would Joseph do this when it was completely within his legal rights to have her stone? Now, remember, at this time, Joseph had not talked to the angel yet. He had not heard from the angel. He didn't know what was going on. Why would Joseph not have her killed? Because Joseph loved Mary. Joseph loved Mary. Mary, can I be completely, completely transparent with you this morning? 
My heart has been burdened for several weeks, but it is especially burdened today. Because more and more husbands and wives are cohabitating and coexisting with each other rather than loving each other. I believe lots and lots of husbands and wives just tolerate each other instead of passionately loving each other. Men, I want to talk to you just for a second. Men, listen to me. I want to ask you a question, men. Do you know how you are biblically <coughs> supposed to love your wife? <coughs> men, do you know how you are biblically supposed to love your wife? I'm not asking you, men, if you know what Hollywood says. I'm not asking you, men, if you passed your health class back in high school. I'm not even asking you, men, if you do what your dad taught you to do. What I'm asking you, do you know how the Bible says you are to love your wife? Okay, I'm going to show you. Look on the screen in Ephesians chapter 5. Husbands, love your wives, even as Christ also loved the church and gave Himself for it. Verse 28, So ought to men love their wives as their own bodies. He that loveth his wife loveth himself. Men, these two verses right here tell you how to love your wives. You are to love them as Christ loved the church and as you love yourself. <clears throat> now, this is what some of you are going to say to me. Oh, Brother Philip, I'm not going to love my wife that way. You don't understand. My wife, my wife don't love me that way, and I'm not going to start loving her until she starts loving on me. Really? You know what the Bible says about that? It don't matter. It don't matter how your wife loves you. Men, you have to love your wife like yourself, and as Christ loved the church, and guess what? Christ made the first move Showing the church how he loved to Look at 1 John 4, 19. We love him because he first loved us. Who made the first move in the relationship, love relationship between God and man? God made the first move. Who made the first relate, move in the love relationship between Christ and the church? Christ. And who is to make the first move in the love relationship between a man and a woman? The man. Men, men, it is our job to make the first move. You can act all tough and gruff like you don't care what your wife thinks. You can be all big and bad around your buddies. You can live life like you want to and do whatever you want to regardless of what your wife thinks. But listen to me. You don't need, you don't need to be concerned about what your wife thinks or what the preacher thinks. You need to be concerned about what God thinks. And God says... You are to love the woman that He gave you. And you are to treat her in the way that He's told you to treat her. And if you don't, sir, you will have to stand before the Lord at the judgment seat of Christ and answer for it. Man, if I've got your attention and you realize you need to start loving your wife like you love yourself and the way Christ loved the church, there's no better time to start than right now. Some of you are already doing this. But for those of you that are not, put your arm around your wife. Reach over and hold her hand. Let her know that she's important to you because she's important to God. And let me say this to you, sir. I'm a full service preacher. If you're having trouble with this, come talk to me. Give me a call. Give me a text. And I'll help you and I'll walk you through it. And I'm going to let you in on a little secret, sir. I've helped a whole bunch of men in this church and I'll be proud to help you. Now, in addition to being a full service preacher, I'm also an equal opportunity preacher. Now that I've got the men stirred up, women, it's time for me to talk to you for a little while. <laughs> Ladies, do you know how the Bible says you are to love your husbands? Jesus, it's quiet in here. <clears throat> Let me give you a little clue, ladies. God did not ordain you with a special anointing from on high to point out every single one of your husband's faults and failures. Your husband did not all of a sudden lose half his brain cells the moment that he said, I do to you. 
God did not call you to fix your husband. That's God's job. God did not call you to change your husband. That's God's job. God has called you to live your life God's way and to let His light shine through you in such a way that it attracts your husband to the Lord. Look at what 1 Peter 3, 1 says. Likewise, you wives, be in subjection to your own husbands, that if any obey not the word, that they also without the word. Let me give you the redneck translation on without the word there. Without your nagging. Without your nagging. That without your word, be won by the conversation or the lifestyle of the wives. Ladies, you are to love your husband in such a way that he sees the light of Christ shining through you and it attracts him to Christ. Not just salvation in Christ, but a deeper walk with Christ. Wives, can I ask you a question? Are you leading your husband to the Lord? Or are you pushing him away from Christ? Remember, ladies, your job isn't to change him. That's God's job. Your job's not to fix him. That's God's job. Your job is to love him and lead him to the Lord. Ladies, if this is something you need help with, I'll be glad to talk with you in the presence of my wife. Not by ourselves. I'll be glad to talk with you in the presence of my wife. And we'll be glad to talk with you about what has worked and what had not worked. In our marriage. Now I told you I'm an equal opportunity pastor. There's two other groups of people here that I need to talk to in just a second. The first is two dear ladies on the second row, my widows. My widows that I dearly love. You know, talking about your loved one and how much you love them, I'm sure it's kind of hard. Kind of uncomfortable. And I know that. But I've got a special word from the Lord for my witness this morning. You should consider yourself extremely blessed for ever experiencing love in your lifetime because most people never do. Most people, ladies, never, ever get to experience what the two of y'all experience with your husband. And by the simple fact that you got to experience that, you should be thankful to God for ever, ever allowing you that privilege. And lastly, the other group that I want to speak to is to the young and the unmarried here today. If you're not married, I want you to listen to me very carefully. I've told the males how to love the females. I've told the females how to love the males. But I also, young people, want to tell you what love is not. Love is not a feeling. Love is a choice. Love is not a noun. Love is a verb. Love is not swapping slobber with anything that you can get to sit still long enough. You can get a black Angus bull to sit still long enough to do that. <laughs> love is not going as far as you can without going all the way. Love is not going all the way in the back seat of a car or God knows where just hoping you don't get caught. That's not love. God's plan for you, young people, is exactly what happened to me. Aaron Chambers is the only person I've ever kissed in my lifetime. Aaron Chambers is the only person that I've ever had sexual relations with and that did not occur until after we were married. That's God's way, young people. Erin Chambers is my BFF. She's my best friend in the whole world. The person that I share my life with. And I tell Erin every single day that I love her. And I remind her she's my number two love. Behind my love for the Lord. Takeaway number one from today's message. Joseph loved his spouse. 
men and women, it is high time that we quit tolerating and cohabitating and we started loving our spouse the way the Bible tells us to. We start showing our kids how it's done. Takeaway number two. Joseph listened to the Lord. After Joseph <coughs> discovered that his fiancée Mary was pregnant, he decided to put her away privately. But before he could do that, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream and said, Don't be afraid to take Mary to be your wife. That which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost, and she's going to bring forth a son. You'll name him Jesus because he will save the world from their sins. Now I want to stop right there just for a minute. Listen to me. There's a whole lot of people in the world today that don't even want to listen to what God has to say. Now look, I'm not talking about obeying the Lord. I'm talking about the step before obedience. Obedience is step number two. Step number one is just listening to it. There's a lot of people that don't even want to listen. They don't come to church because they don't want to listen to it. But I want to break that down just a little bit further. Just because you're here at Yellow Creek today doesn't mean you want to listen to it. You, you may have me completely tuned out right now. You may be thinking about the Titans game or what you're going to eat for dinner or what you got to do at work next week or all the Christmas presents that you've got to buy. Your mind may be a million miles away from here right now. But if you'll just listen to me for the next 15 seconds, I'm going to give you the message the Lord wants you to hear. If you're listening, say we're listening. All that junk can wait. All that junk can wait. You don't need to be worried about the game, or your work, your next meal, or Christmas. God wants you to put all of that on pause. And just focus on Him. Listen to what He's telling you. And not only does He want to do it today, He wants you to do that every day. He, want, he wants you to put your life on pause in the mornings. And I know you've got lots of running around doing lots of things to do. But he wants you to put your life on pause. And just listen to what He has to say to you before you start your day. Friend, I know your body is here and all your ears here. Is your mind on the message from the Lord? Are you listening to the Lord? Joseph, listen to the Lord. And we should listen. That brings us to takeaway number three. You probably figured this out. Not only did Joseph listen, but Joseph also lived obediently. He lived obediently to the Lord. After Joseph listened to the message from the angel of the Lord, Joseph faced a choice. Joseph could either A, continue on as planned and put Mary away privately, or he could change course and he could live obediently to what the Lord told him to do. And he could take Mary to be his wife. Joseph faced a choice. And he chose to live obediently. Now we have the benefit of knowing what was going to happen here. But do you realize how hard the choice was for Joseph to make to go ahead and take Mary it would have been much, much easier on Joseph to just put her away and go on with his life. But that's not what the Lord wanted. And so Joseph chose to be obedient and not put her away and to take her to be his wife. Here's the word for us, ladies and gentlemen. Obedience to the Lord is not always an easy road. In fact, more times than not, obedience to the Lord is one of the toughest roads to take. God never promised us that life would be easy. And in our 21st century culture, with all of our modern conveniences that are made to make our life easier, it's even harder to pick the difficult road of obedience to the Lord. Now, let me just say this. It's hard... To be obedient to the Lord and write your tithe check first when you got other bills you need to pay. It's hard 
to read your Bible each day when you've got a million other things that you need to do. It's hard to forgive and forget, to love and let go. It's hard to remain silent in order to keep the peace. But that is exactly what the Lord's telling us to do. And in addition to all the admonitions and the commandments that He gives us, He gives us some insight in His Word to being obedient. Look at John 14, 15. If you love me, keep or obey my commandments. Deuteronomy eleven twenty seven. 27. A blessing if you obey the commandments of the Lord your God, which I command you this day. Acts 5, 29. Then Peter and the other apostles answered and said, We ought to obey God rather than men. Is that how you feel? Do you feel it's better to obey God rather than obeying man? Or do you just pick whichever road is going to be the easiest? The Lord wants us to live obediently like Joseph did. And that brings me to takeaway number four. Not only did Joseph live obediently, but he also lived sacrificially. He lived sacrificially. Many times in order to be obedient to the Lord, not only do we have to go down an uncomfortable road, but we also have to sacrifice. I want you to look at the last verse of our passage, Matthew 1, 25. And knew not her till she had brought forth her firstborn son, and he called his name Jesus. Now most people, when they read that verse right there, they focus on the last five words, and called his name Jesus. Oh, that's great. Joseph listened to the Lord and eight days after Jesus was born when they brought him to the temple and they asked for the name, Joseph said, His name is Jesus. But I want you to focus on the first part of that verse. And knew her not until she had brought forth her firstborn son. In the King James Version, that I preached out of this morning, that word, knew her not, is referring to sexual relations. In other words, Joseph obeyed the Lord. He took Mary to be his wife, but instead of being able to consummate his marriage on his wedding night, Joseph had to sacrifice so that in no way, shape, form, or fashion could the Christ child ever be perceived as having been born into sin like you and I are born into sin? Even though Joseph and Mary were now legally married, even though Joseph had been waiting anxiously for his, this moment his entire life, Joseph would have to sacrifice. He would have to put off consummation for at least three to five months until Mary gave birth and until she had been ceremonially cleansed according to the law. Now, I don't know about you, friend, but I remember what it was like to be 22. And that's an incredible sacrifice if you ask me. And that's just one of the many sacrifices that Joseph was asked to make. As Jesus is earthly Father. God asked His followers to sacrifice for Him since the beginning of time. Cain and Abel sacrificed. Noah sacrificed. Abraham sacrificed. Moses sacrificed. Joshua sacrificed. David sacrificed. Solomon sacrificed. Jesus talked about sacrifices in Mark chapter 10. He answered and said, Verily I say unto you, there is no man that has left house, brethren, sisters, father, mother, wife, children, lands, for my sake and for the Gospels, but he shall receive a hundredfold now in this time, houses, brethren, sisters, mothers, children, lands, with persecutions, and in the world to come eternal life. Ladies and gentlemen, Jesus is still asking us to sacrifice for Him today. Now look, a whole lot of people don't want to hear about sacrifice. Oh, Brother Philip, we're there with you, brother. We're going to come to church and we're going to take part and we're going to give when we can and we're going to do and we're going to work. But Brother Philip, don't ask us to sacrifice. Honey, I'm not asking you to sacrifice. God's telling you to sacrifice. God told me and Aaron not just to obey Him and tithe to Yellow Creek, but He also told us to sacrificially give 
to the building fund. Do you realize there's plenty of other things that Aaron and I could be doing with that money? We could be trying to pay off our mortgage. We could be putting back for the kids' education. We could be doing a whole lot of things with that money. But that's not what God has asked us to do. He has asked us to sacrifice, to go above and beyond our tithe, and to give. And the sacrifices that He asks us to do, guys, are not just money related. They're also time related. Aaron and I used to never miss an Austin Peay basketball game. Oh no, we were members of the Govs Club. We wore the red and white. We followed the Austin Peay basketball team to Little Rock, Arkansas for the NCAA tournament. But God has asked us to sacrifice that time. And to do things for Him instead. Now my sacrifice and your sacrifice may be the same, they may be different. I'm not the one telling you to sacrifice. It's God. I'm not going to be the one to tell you what to sacrifice. That's God's job. The question is, are you willing to live sacrificially like Joseph lived sacrificially? That brings us to takeaway number five. He not only listened to the Lord, he not only lived obediently and lived sacrificially, he also left his comfort. Joseph left his comfort zone. If you keep reading in Matthew, you get in chapter 2 and you get the story of the wise men. And in the story of the wise men, they came to Jerusalem and asked Herod, Herod, where is he that is born king of the Jews? And Herod said, king of the Jews, king of the Jews, king of the Jews. Well, when you find this king of the Jews, would you please tell me where he is so that way I can come worship him? Herod didn't want to worship Jesus. He wanted to exterminate him. He thought Jesus was a threat to his power. So the wise men didn't come back and tell Herod where Jesus was. And it absolutely infuriated Herod. So he ordered that all male children two years old and under be killed. But look what happened to Joseph. Matthew chapter 2 verse 13. When they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream saying, Arise, take the young child and his mother, and flee to Egypt. And be thou there until I bring thee word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. And when he arose, he took the young child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt. Not only did Joseph listen to the Lord, not only did he live obediently and live sacrificially, he had to leave his comfort zone, leave his support system in Bethlehem, and move to a foreign in order to save the baby Jesus' life. Ladies and gentlemen, I submit to you this morning that God is still calling men and women to leave their comfort zones in order to serve Him. He had me to get out of my comfort zone and to start dealing with conflict. Look, I'm a lover, not a fighter. But as pastor of this church, I can ignore conflict, I can let it fester, and then we can have a bigger problem to deal with down the road, or I can just rip the band-aid off right then and we can get it over with where it don't hurt near as bad. Now, is that my comfort zone? Uh-uh. But is that what Jesus called us to do? You better believe it. This is an area where I am so proud of my wife. For those of you who don't know, my wife's a doctor, and she don't really... Dealing with children is just not her thing. She'd rather be talking with brainiacs than booger pickers, okay? Just the way she is. But God called my wife to start our teen kid here and to get out of her comfort zone and to start our teen kid with her kids on Wednesday nights. And before that, God called Aaron to get out of her comfort zone and start teaching those young children Sunday school classes. And she got out of her comfort zone and the Lord blessed what comfort zone has the Lord called you to leave, church? Praise God, last night at the Kitchen Kids Christmas party, Miss Gail Brandon came up to me and she said, the Lord's laid on my heart to get out of my comfort zone and help teach a class here at the Oak Creek. Thank you, Miss Gail. Maybe the Lord is leading you to step out of your comfort zone and volunteer with our children or our youth. Maybe He wants you to help with our visitation and outreach. Maybe He wants you to work in the nursery, sing in the choir, lead a prayer group, teach a class, or something else. But let me tell you up front, whatever He calls you to do, more than likely, it's going to lead you out of your comfort zone. Why? So He can get the glory, not you. 
Takeaway number five, Joseph left his comfort zone. If we follow the calling God places on our life, more than likely we'll have to leave our comfort zone too. Takeaway number six, and this is going to make some of you mad. Oh, I'm leaving to go to Baltimore this afternoon for three days. And if you're going to get mad, I'm leaving, okay? <laughs> Joseph did very little talking. <clears throat> he did very little talking. And all of the accounts of Joseph in the Bible, Matthew and Luke, we do not have one single direct quotation. Not one. Now it's inferred that he spoke, but we don't have a single direct quotation of, Jesus, of Joseph talking. Ladies and gentlemen, how much better would we be we turned the old talker meter down sometimes and did a lot more listening and a lot less talking. You know, that's the whole reason the Lord gave you two ears and one mouth. He talks about this in Proverbs 10, 19. In the multitude of words, there wanteth not sin. He that refraineth his lips is wise. Proverbs 17. He that hath knowledge spareth his words, and a man of understanding is of an excellent spirit. Even a fool, when he holdeth his peace, is counted wise. He that shutteth his lips is esteemed a man of understanding. James 1.19 Wherefore, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to rap. Church, there's times that we need to speak up. But there's also a whole lot of times we just need to keep quiet. Not say it. I know this is basic, but listen, a lot of us don't do it. Think before you speak. If what you're going to say is gossip, if what you're about to say is not glorifying and edifying to the kingdom of God, then maybe, just maybe, you should be quiet. Takeaway number six, Joseph did a little talking. Takeaway number seven. Don't tune me out when I say this. I want you to hear me out. Don't say, well, that preacher's preaching heresy. Listen to me. Takeaway number seven. Joseph lost Jesus. Joseph lost Jesus. In Luke chapter 2, we have a record of Joseph and Mary losing Jesus. Verse 41. Now his parents went to Jerusalem every year at the Feast of Passover. And when he was 12 years old, they went up to Jerusalem after the custom of the feast. When they had filled the days as they returned it, the child Jesus tarried behind them in Jerusalem, and Joseph and his mother knew not of it. But they, supposing him to have been in the company, went a day's journey, and they saw him among their kinsfolk and acquaintance. And when they found him not, they turned back again to Jerusalem seeking him. And as we know from the rest of the story, Joseph and Mary eventually found him in the temple, reasoning with the doctors of the law. But right here in verse 41 through 45, Joseph had lost Jesus. Now listen very carefully. Very, very carefully. Did Joseph and Mary cease being Jesus' parents when they lost Him? No. And in the same way, when we lose, or let me, let me give you some better language here, when we misplace or misprioritize Jesus in our life, we're truly saved. We're not going to lose ourselves. But that does not remove the fact that we've misplaced Him in our lives. We've misprioritized Jesus in our life. And we've put all these things in front of Him. When we get up first thing in the morning, instead of getting in our Bible and studying the Word of God, we turn on the TV or we check on Facebook. Instead of walking closely to Him like we used to walk closely to Him, it feels now like He's a thousand miles away from us. Guess what? The Lord's not the one that's moved. You've moved. He's always been where He always is. And today, He's calling you prodigal son. He's calling you prodigal daughter. Come back! Come back! Have 
you lost or misplaced Jesus? Have you misprioritized Jesus in your life? Do you have things ahead of Him in your life? Now some of you are looking at me like I'm slab crazy. You're saying, Philip, what in the world do you mean about losing Jesus? Let me tell you why you don't understand about losing Jesus. It's because you've never had Him in the first place. You've never been saved. You've never asked Him to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins. That billboard on I-40 says that this book is a fairy tale, but I'm standing here on the authority of this book telling you it is completely real from cover to cover. There is a real place called heaven with streets of gold and gates of pearl and walls of jasper in that place called heaven, there will be no more stress. There will be no more pain. There will be no more dying. There will be no more tears. There will be no more separation. There will be no more IRS agents. There will be no more poison oak. There will be no more fleas. There will be no more chiggers. Hallelujah! But there's also a very real place called hell. Where the worm dies not. Where you're in total darkness and smoke and flames and torture and torment forever. And the Bible says if you give your heart to Jesus, when you die, you go to heaven. If you don't give your heart to Jesus, when you die, Guys, getting saved and giving your heart to Christ is way more than your eternal destination. It's also about when you get saved, man, you get all these benefits that are just awesome. You get a friend that sticks closer than a brother. You get joy unspeakable and full of glory. You get peace that passes all understanding. You get love that covers a multitude of sins. You get all of these wonderful things that come as fringe benefits of being a Christian. See, I got saved when I was 10, but all I thought I was doing was pouching my ticket to heaven. I thought I was just getting my fire insurance in order. I mean, it wasn't until I was 26 years old that I realized all these other things that came with being saved. And when I started to realize that, I said, hey, this is the best thing I've ever found. I don't want everybody to know about this. I want you to know about it. You get all of that when you give your heart to Jesus. If you choose not to give your heart to Jesus, you lose all of that and you end up in hell when you die. Why in the world, friend, would you make that choice? Especially, especially, if we're living in the day and time that we live in right now. If you read your Bible, you see all these signs of the times. And I believe with all my heart this thing's fixing to wind up and end up pretty quick. Give your heart to Jesus today while you still have an opportunity. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, I love you and I want you to know how much I love you. And I thank you, Lord, for this message about Joseph that you gave me this week. And how you've challenged me to love my wife like Joseph loved Mary. You've challenged me, dear Lord, to listen, to intentionally listen to you, to not be so busy doing other things that I don't listen. You've challenged me, Lord, to live obediently. To live sacrificially. And to be willing to leave my comfort zone. You've challenged me, Lord, to do a little talking. And Lord, you've challenged me never to lose you, to never misplace you, to never misprioritize you. Lord, for the rest of my life, I want to walk as close as I possibly can to you. I want that sweet fellowship to never, ever be hindered in any way at all. Lord, I want to pray for everybody that's here today at Yellow Creek under the sound of my voice. Your Holy Spirit told me that there are people that are coming today that have never asked you to be Lord and Savior. 
Father, I don't know who they are. But I'm asking you right now, dear Lord, to start calling them to you. Start knocking on their heart's door. Start making them feel uncomfortable in such a way that they know, hey, they need to get right with you while they've got the chance to get right with you right now. They need to get saved right now. 